shining today I don't want to put my head down I want to be happy for what I found I want to thank the Lord and say Lord keep sun to shine on me and I know ain't nobody gonna be greedy around me because I'm gonna be happy I say happiness is what I need that's how I feel every day I say I gotta work hard and pray I say everybody wants to run around they want to make a lot of money. Is that going to make them happy? I say, hey, if you agree, you'll never be happy. I say, I want happiness in my life. I want to get a wife. I want to correct too. I want to do what I got to do. Here I'm making up as I go along. That means I'm happy, I say. Because I'm feeling good each and every day. Because I say, I listen to what the music says. It says, happiness, I busted the string on my guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The world is in a very stressful place right now. Sometimes it's our own personal issues that are affecting us. And sometimes it's the larger issue of the planet. There's a principle which says that God has the answer to every problem the moment it occurs. Whether we have an individual personal problem or we have a collective problem, our mind immediately goes to what will I do or what should I do. The tower is about consequences. awful day. I remember having this outrageous thought. The one and only thing that I could do for this world was to be peaceful within myself. Of course, that was not peaceful in myself on that day or on any other day, but I became resolved to try. Okay, the planes hit the World Trade Center. There is in that moment, a plan that emerges from the mind of God, and that plan is for the healing of the world. However, God can't do anything except through people. He can't do anything for us that he can't do through us. God is the electricity, but we're the lamps. So the world as we experience it, whether it's your private life or our planetary existence, is a reflection of the people that we have been. You with me? So if we want the world to change, we have to become new people. So here's the human race on a suicidal rampage. That's what's happening right now. The war on terrorism, the biological desecration. So there are so many stress factors on the planet right now. So God's plan is for us to become the people who have the level of wisdom and intelligence necessary. We have to become the people who, even if we can discern what it is we're supposed to do, have the maturity to be able to do it. Unless and until we make a quantum leap inside ourselves, we can't be the conduits for the quantum leap that has to occur in the world. What that looks like in our lives is that we're all stressed out because we're being put through a very rapid pace of change. Our grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren need you to become the Sean that you're capable of being on this planet. Do you believe in reincarnation? Sure. Well, good to see you again then. <laughs> Rule number one, don't believe me, but learn to listen. Don't believe me. Because what I'm telling you is just a story. It's a point of view how I see life. Mm. And it's truth just for me. But if you learn to listen, you will understand what I try to communicate. Then don't believe me, but learn to listen. Listening points to who you truly are. Underneath 
all the things that continuously change. While you listen and do everything else, if you're in the present moment, then all the joy that's there becomes apparent to you. And so attention is that which is there when you're truly listening. The second rule is a little more difficult. Don't believe yourself. You know, your head is talking all the time. It's like a wild horse that is taking you anywhere. If you don't learn how to tame the horse, the horse will take you wherever the horse wants you. <laughs> then don't believe yourself, but learn to listen what you have in your head. And the third one is very interesting also. You don't believe anybody else exactly for the same reason. Whatever they tell you is truth only for them. And it's the way how they express the experience that they have in life. But if you learn to listen, you will see that in between all those lies, the truth is coming. And you will be able to perceive that truth. Then if you don't believe yourself, if you don't believe anybody else, if you don't believe me, all those lies will not survive, but the truth will survive. Believe it or not, the sun will be in the sky every single day. You don't need to believe in the truth in order that the truth exists. But for the lies to exist, you need to believe in those lies. If I don't believe myself, and I don't believe anyone else, then... Not as an attitude. No, really don't believe it. Not as a social position that you say, oh, I don't believe them. No, no, no. You're faking it. No, that needs to be for real. But you learn to listen. That is exactly the key. Learn to listen. So how can I be a warrior for my happiness? The most beautiful fun of the warrior is to go and clean up the garden every day because you know someone will put a bad seed in it and it will grow. If you keep feeding that bad seed, which is lies and things that make you happy, that will grow, baby. You catch it right away. Hmm, this is not happy, boom. And you forget about it because you continue in the now. And that is beautiful. Happiness is a decision I must make. Happiness comes from your perspective. I am more responsible for my happiness than I used to know. It's not about what's happening out there. It's about how I show up within what's happening. Every individual brings a little piece of the piece. A little piece here, a little piece there, and pretty soon you'll have a big piece everywhere. But it starts with you, developing your inner piece and then letting it out. The word I is probably the most frequently used word in the language. I am angry, I am American, I am this, I am that. That I is the greatest delusion. So if I'm not something, am I nothing? Yes, I would pronounce that differently, though. I would say, you are no thing. Now, there's a difference between no thing and nothing. Nothing is simply a denial. But no thing means there is a presence there, but it has no form. Hey, shiny boy. How's the monk in training coming, huh? Are you meditating? What do you think? Can you teach me to elevate? You mean levitate? Action can come from the limited mind, and it's not usually skillful action. Or action can arise out of the state of aware presence. Sit. Listen, we need to talk. Oh, Sean, let's don't. Well, you don't look ready. Look, I don't want to do the cattle call for extreme dating. I'm an actor. Ah, hey, how about a, a birthday party in Beverly Hills? Tell me that's a movie. It is a birthday party in Beverly Hills. 
I haven't had a real gig in two years, man. Damn it. Look, kid, you gotta stick it out, that's all. That's called paying your dues. You know what, you're probably right. But I need a break, so... I think I'm gonna go to Hawaii. Oh, Hawaii? The closest you're gonna get to Hawaii is looking at the water in the toilet bowl. Why over and over and over and over throughout salvation history has God's message to humanity been, do not be afraid? Two reasons. Number one, he senses that we are backed into a corner. Senses that we are afraid to step out and celebrate the best version of ourselves. Number two, the reason God's message to us throughout the ages has been do not be afraid because he knows that the measure of your life will be the measure of your courage. Go home tonight and take the five people you most admire from the history books and then ask yourself, who would they be without courage? The answer, you wouldn't even know their names. From the beginning, he has claimed that he is a victim of an FBI conspiracy, a political prisoner. But in spite of his protests, Pratt stands convicted of the senseless murder and $18 robbery of a 27-year-old white woman. Are you telling me that you learned to be happy in prison? I found freedom, my understanding of freedom. Out of all of my 58 years, I found it in the depths of the worst holes and San Quentin and Folsom Prison. It took the process of detaching from everything. You don't have any desires. You stop masturbating. So you don't have no sexual desire, all that. But that's where I found true freedom. The desire, the submission, the release of the ego, the understanding that you are just a small part of something much bigger. And once you begin to adapt your body, your mind to these things, this external stimuli, all these things, and understanding that we all are part of something, that a continuation of something, and you reach that balance, then you feel happiness that you would probably never feel from drugs, from anything else. I ended up in jail because of situations that were concocted by Richard Nixon. When they were judged by Congress in 76, that they were actually wrong, that they were criminals, and you had convictions out of that. They went to San Clemente, and we went to San Quentin. 1970s, a series of things began to happen. A Senate investigating committee found that the FBI had had a highly questionable counterintelligence program aimed at the Black Panthers, and that Pratt was a special target. My first eight years of my 27 years in prison was in the hole in San Quentin and Folsom. And back then, those holes consisted of uh, just an uh, empty cell, very inhumane and very torturous. These are the most intelligent beings that I've ever encountered in my life, ants. My first couple of years, I was always Garden against the ants, you know, because my toilet was a hole in the floor, you know. And they would crawl out of there, they would come, and they would bite. So after a while, I, I realized that this is their world. I'm just here, and why am I killing them? You know, just let them continue to bite me. I just surrendered to them. And once I submitted to that situation, they stopped biting me. And then after a while, they started bringing me things, like little crumbs and whatnot that I could eat. And then that caused me to uh, thank them. I was so grateful because at that time, guards would not feed you. Sometimes I was on bread and water for a long time. It was just a good feeling of gratitude that I think opened me up and made me reduce my ego. That act of submission to reduce yourself because you got this macho, you above everything, and you can fight anything, you know, and now you're being made to submit to this tiny creature. And then you learn so much from it. That really had a big impact on my life. I began to, to meditate and to do certain things that was later told to me to be a part of uh, the transcendental meditations and the 
uh, astral projections, and all of these things that I read later. The Maharajnis, Krishna Murtis, led to this thing that you had to let go. You had to not have an ego. You had to, you know, not be attached to all of these things which are causing you to deteriorate. But once you reach that, it's like you are just like a spirit that just exists in and of yourself. If we look into the wisdom tradition of Buddhism, they managed to condense the reason for all unhappiness into one word. And the one word that they came up with was self-centeredness. All unhappiness comes from this. And the Buddha said that all of our concerns about self can be put into eight things. Praise and blame, loss and gain, pleasure and pain, and fame and shame. So pretty much anything that makes you feel up or down is in that category. It's one of those. And that's only something that you're concerned about when you're operating from a self-center. Now here's the catch. You just learned that whenever you're self-conscious, you're proceeding in the world from your thoughts. You're not in reality, but you're in a universe that revolves around those eight things. And so you react to everything according to how they affect you. Did it give me pleasure? Did it cause me pain? Did I lose something? Did I gain something? Everything's about that. And your happiness rides up and down. So Buddha saw everything in this wheel. They said, if you're on that treadmill, you're lost because one will come to the other. So you have to move into the present if you want to be happy. What's for dinner, Sean? Grass and leaves? Hello. Sean. So what do Jews expect from you? Jews are first and foremost a, a people of, of doing, of practice. You know, we don't have any of this uh, salvation issue. We don't believe people come into the world in need of being saved. You're sort of expected to make something of yourself, something that has eternal value. We also believe that the way to do it is sort of like what I'm doing here. You don't, you don't become a powerhouse by willing it or by wishing it. You have to make small incremental changes in your life. The big picture is making something of yourself in this world. How do I do that? You study. You find out about yourself and you find out about God. Anything that he asks us to do has to be for our benefit because he wants to make us happy. That's what life is about. That's why he created us. It's all about happiness.
about the International Choir with the wonderful house band. If this is your first time, just stand up. Welcome to Agape. Peace and blessings. Life is hard until you die, but bliss and ecstasy, joy and harmony, these qualities are potent and powerful. They may be subtle, but they're potent and powerful. And as you, on a regular basis, begin to make a heavenly choice, extending the good that you know, you discover that even the circumstances and the situations begin to melt because they are the coagulated thought forms that we all agreed upon. Because your conscious awareness of the all good is stronger than that circumstance. But it begins with your awareness that you have the capacity to choose to become more and more aware of the fundamental harmony of your being. Say, in this moment, I make a new choice. I choose heaven. I choose to extend my good. I can thank independent of circumstances. I am duly empowered by the Spirit of God to anchor heaven on earth. Are you with me? Agree with each other. And let the celebration begin. Religion is now evolving, where we're becoming aware that all of us have the capacity to be God conscious or to be love conscious and to remove ourselves from being a victim of circumstance. This guy's looking at me. Why are you looking at me? Come on, just. Can I get in, please? Thank. Hello, can I get in? Anger is, a, is an emotion that covers up fear. And oftentimes, um, we have anger because we're afraid Damn to feel it. our fear. We develop compulsive behaviors. But if you're willing to just stop and acknowledge that you're afraid, then you can also acknowledge that somewhere within you, you're bigger than the fear. I believe we grow two ways, pain or insight. And so you either get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Hey, Tweedle Dummer. Well, we talked about the towel being a part of the uniform. I'm just going to clean up this sweat over here. Um, it is all about service, dude. Yeah, I, I guess I forgot my towel. Or you have an insight that births you to another paradigm. I don't think I should have to provide that service, Damien. Suffering is not the price tag that you pay to be happy. Yes, and if you bring in three people for this month, we're going to give you a free gym bag. Okay, great. Uh, yes, ma'am? Uh-huh. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh -huh. Happiness does not have to be um, something that happens at the end of some kind of goal. Happiness can be along the way. It's, it's a moment-by-moment it's a, it's a moment choice. Hey, buddy. So how come you haven't turned any of those new session agreements? Oh, yeah. Because you haven't sold any this month. I get on it. Damien, <clears throat> you're one of those brain-dead morons who thinks that stupidity is a virtue. Huh? Exactly. I quit. Oh, yeah. Lose the pot belly. If we ever want to be happy, we have to make sense of suffering. We have to realize that there's something in suffering that adds to the meaning of life, that helps us and allows us to be and become the best version of ourselves. And that is one of the great mysteries we have to delve further and further into. But an individual who's living a purposeful life, which means the gifts and the talents, the capabilities, the intrinsic joy, compassion, love that is within us, when you live to let that come out, you find that you achieve goals and you do tasks, but they're a subset of a larger way of living. The library here is one of the finest collections of wisdom literature in North America. And the idea behind that is, is that these are the great 
cultures of the world, each one has its own wisdom literature. And they're about the laws of nature, the great principles of the universe. They're what we call perennial philosophy, all about the higher values of existence and how you acquire them. You know, Plato answered your question by saying, if you organize your life around one of the higher values, all the rest will come to you because all the higher values commune with each other. And his highest value was beauty. So he organized his life around beauty. And to him, beauty was a being. But just organize your life around one of those higher values like beauty, truth, love, freedom, justice, equality, peace, and happiness will come to you. That would be his answer. I think it's a good one. And then, you know, the, the man goes and searching for the bull, and then he finds the bull, and then he uses a halter on the bull, and finally he gets on the bull, and eventually the bull becomes so tame that he throws away the halter, sits upon the bull, and reads his scroll as the bull safely takes him home. That's the story of our lives, you know, is, is, is controlling our animal nature until finally it becomes one with our higher nature. So the bull really stands for uh, the possibility of every human being totally integrated, not being distracted by his lower nature, but by being assisted by it. So there's a somatic wisdom in our body, physical wisdom in every cell of your being. And once you get harmony with that, then the trip home is really easy. You can see this full basana of the lotus that, that covers the Buddha and is a total protection to him. And here's the thousand petal lotus, symbolic of full illumination. While the lotus comes out of the mud and the darkness that is below, it becomes transformed in the realized Buddha. You see, we all have a Buddha within us, and this represents its full blossoming. Isn't that a great, great promise to think about? What it says to me is that, well, happiness is, a, is an inside job. And you can see the, the total contentment in the look of the face and the posture. I never have any money, and I want money. Oh, you want money? Yeah. You're coming to the wrong guy. <laughs> if you wanted to release your attachment to money, I could help you do that. Will that bring me money? No, that will bring me money. <laughs> do cars bring people happiness? Of course. For how long? For how long? <laughs> mm, a couple of months. <laughs> you want to be happy for a whole day? Go shopping. It feels great, but it doesn't last, and then the credit card bills come. You know, if you want to be happy for a whole weekend, do whatever you do for a weekend. Go fishing, go golfing. You want to be happy for a whole month? Take a vacation. Go down to Australia, you have a great time. If you want to be happy for a whole year, inherit a fortune. But if you want to be happy for a lifetime, you've got to find a way to make a difference in other people's lives. You've got to find a way to make a contribution. Most people are so concerned with getting to success that they forget significance. And that's the great journey, is the journey to significance, not the journey to success. what would happen to Hollywood or what would happen to athletes or what would happen to movie stars if, if folk were not groupies anymore. I think the industry would still succeed, but uh, I don't know if people would hold it in the kind of esteem that they do. But imagine people just following folk, and that's what they do. They follow folk trying to be like them. 
And maybe we need to have everybody understand that you are a unique creature made in God's image and fashioned after God's likeness. And if you just develop into being the best that you can be, that's better than a false anybody else who you can't be anyway. The reality is, in humanity, there is a desire to want to worship. What we do is misplace who ought to be worshipped. We worship other people who do what we find difficult to do, and we live our lives through what they do, as opposed to recognizing that they don't deserve our worship. The only one worthy of worship is God, because God has made all of us and given us any ability or capacity or potential that we possess. And so we ought to be thankful for whatever it is we are privileged to achieve, because if we hadn't been given what we were given, we would not have been able to do that anyway. I am not here because I have to be here. I'm here by choice because I understand that currently we are in the material world and it's like being in a house which is on fire. If you're awake and all your family members are sleeping in a house that's on fire, what kind of individual would you be if you just run out thinking about yourself and leave everybody burned to death? If you can't help somebody, don't hurt them. We're all suffering enough already. Give people more respect than you expect for yourself. And uh, if you've got nothing good to say, shut the f up, put a harmonica in your mouth. That's why I do it. So people don't recognize you're a fool. That's it. Wake up, saving soul. Happiness has to be within. That being the case, what is important is to know, okay, I have been working all these years. I've gone to college, I got a degree, I tried to get a job, but still I'm where I was. So what is really happiness? And we need to talk to our own self. Hey, Sean, what is wrong? What is lacking with you? And when we do a genuine interaction to our own self, it has always been me, mine. And if you want to go a little bit beyond that, ours. So there's always we are making a distinction between oneself and others. And that is a very important finding. Why every one of us are in this rat race? Why? Because we have to get to the destination. Because that is ultimately going to be the source of our relative happiness. This is our contention. This is how we understand. So it is that I, me and my, which is the very source where we are. That's why the great awakened ones says, maybe sometimes you want to know what you were in your past life. Look where you are now. That is the very reflection as to what you were in the past. Then the great being says, however you want your future to be, look into what you do now. We basically need to reorient, restructure, very pattern of our thinking 
That is very hard. But our happiness lies right there. Okay? Okay. Oh, yeah. They're different energy centers, and they all have different sounds. So let's try that, okay? Okay. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Ha, 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 ha. Hey, Austin. What was that quote from Goethe? Das ewige weibliche sieht uns hinan. The eternal feminine draws us onward. Now that I'm over at this woman's house, it's December 21st, 1980. It's, a, it's, it's about midnight by the time we've gotten around to it, because the full moon is really high in the sky. She's sitting there with her back against the window. I remember everything about her hair, how beautiful she looked. I guess, you know, like a lot of guys, we're just bluffing it. We're only doing what worked with the last woman each time we meet a new woman, right? And at 22, you know, I was a bit tentative. She was nine years older than I was, uh, more experienced worldly. And she must have understood my tentativeness. All of a sudden, for the first time in my life, it's broached to me that sex isn't about getting to the orgasm, isn't goal-oriented. It's not about goals. It's not about getting to the final end of the journey. It's about enjoying the journey. If you enjoy the journey, it won't matter what your goal is. It won't matter what goal you get, because you don't always get what you want. Anything you want? Uh, so, uh, what's good here? Well, the pastries are real good, and the quiche rocks. Oh, okay. Well, then, uh, I'll try the quiche. You get what you get. Life is short. Cram as many women into your life as possible. How's your salad? It's good. Yeah, I love lettuce. Mm -hmm. Not me. You've got to grow old gracefully, but you're very mortal. And these experiences only happen in one lifetime, and you've got to grab every single one that goes by. Do you want to... Um... Watch a movie or anything? Mm, you know what? I can't. Well, do you want to fool around or anything? <laughs> mm, no. <laughs> How old are you? 24. Well, the first thing you need to do is stop calling them girls. Women? Okay, that's better. That's the beginning. Women. <clears throat> don't understand don't women. Don't understand them? No. I mean, I'm, I know you do. Um, why is the, um, why is there such a disconnect between men and women? Why is there, um, why does the eternal feminine draw us forward? Why does the eternal feminine draw us forward? You mean, why does the eternal feminine draw a man forward? Yeah. Because that's our function in your life. My function in your life is to call you forth. Now, your function in my life is to call me forth. That's what we, that is what men and women are here to do for each other. In The Course in Miracles, it says, you think you need to understand a person to know whether or not they deserve your love. But the truth is, unless you love them, you can't understand them. The reason you don't understand women is because you're not loving them enough yet. Every woman is worthy of your love. I'm not saying every woman you're supposed to have sex with or every woman you're supposed to have a romance with. But your function as a male is to love every one of them. And if you stand in front of a woman, your thought, it's all silent, it's all telepathic, it's all subconscious. If you, when you're just sitting in front of a woman, your thought is, I know you're gorgeous. Uh, you might not be showing to me at the moment, but I invite you because I know that that, as you said, eternal feminine dwells within you and shower me, baby. If that's your thinking, that you really invite a woman to show you how beautiful she is, then in your presence she will. The issue is not how to understand a woman, it's how to love a woman. And that's true about everything in life. And you'll have so much power and you'll remember that I told you that. That's good. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> that's what older women are supposed to do for younger men. Uh -huh. We teach you the secrets. <laughs>
we have a deep narcissism in us, all of us. We have much too much self-love and not enough love of other people. In fact, our self-love gets in the way of our really loving anybody else. Narcissus, if you may remember your Greek mythology, was a man who couldn't love. He refused the love of the nymph Echo, and for that he was cursed by falling in love with himself. After that curse, he came to a lake. He saw his reflection in the lake, and he was so enamored of his own reflection, he couldn't look at anything else. And so he sat looking at his reflection and starved it to death. And eventually he was transformed into the flower, the Narcissus. Now the scary thing is we're all a little bit like Narcissus. We starve ourselves to death from real emotional nourishment. We starve ourselves of real love. There's two levels of things going on. There's what you want at the personal level, at the physical level, and then there's what you want at the soul level. The question is that you would ask the cosmos is which one do you want the cosmos to listen to? To what you want on the personal level or to what you want on the soul level? So what we choose for our personal desires, what we think is so eminently important to us, when we actually experience it, we discover isn't. And that's the journey of every soul, regardless of age, no matter where they are. How many people said, if I only get X amount of dollars, if I could only get X amount of orgasms, if I could only have it happen, a position just like this one where my everything was touched, then it would be perfect. And then you get to that moment, and it isn't because there's always something greater than that in an infinite field of possibilities. You have no way of being able to tell the infinite what is your, your greatest good. You don't even know it. You wouldn't even recognize it. What is it that you're actually looking to achieve? Little things make me very angry. And a lot of times I'm just trying to cover it up. Somebody else isn't going to change that. You're looking to attract, but what you really want to attract is your real self and your spiritual self. If that's your way, the physical way is your way to reach that little piece of perfection, that momentary peace of mind, at least it'll give you a little hint of what true spiritual perfection is. And that is the simplest thing in the world. That's the hardest thing to get, peace of mind. So why is it that I want to be unhappy? We don't realize the world that's available to us until we stop the addictive pattern, the behavior that keeps taking our focus and tying it to the physical plane. You're noticing someone's wearing something that pisses you off. They're saying something that pisses you off. They're looking at you in a way that pisses you yeah. off. And you just keep tying yourself to that plane. Yeah. You're not letting yourself see that everybody's a spirit, just like you, wearing these funky clothes, trying to fit in. You're seeing them as competition. You're seeing them as in your way. You're seeing them as in your face. You're not seeing them as people in the same human struggle that you're in. And as long as you keep tying yourself to the physical plane, you're going to see everything that's wrong with them because you're there too. And it's seeing the beauty in other people that gives you peace of mind and seeing the physical looks and the stupid shoes is everything that separates you from them and as long as you see what separates you from them you're going to be pissed off forever what's true about the illusion of the physical form i don't understand but this is real it's maya it's the illusion my body is real what do you what do you mean a bunch of electromagnetic energy made up to look like a shirt and a flesh and eye, you know, eyeballs. 
and when you see through that and you start looking at people in a spiritual form you realize you're not alone and when you don't feel alone you don't feel so damn miserable all the time the spiritual plane and the physical plane are operating always at the same time it's all operating together so when you join with someone physically you join in with them spiritually so I'm gonna try to make you a potion that just helps your perspective out a little bit Okay. This is your potion oil. You're going to use this to focus. You're going to use this to get to your highest level of consciousness. It smells really good. It's going to work a little faster. This universe is just a uh, speck of dust in the eye of God. Each of us have a direct, it's like a direct radio link to higher wisdom. There's one power, there's one presence, there's one life, there's one God. Everything is energy. I taught you how to serve mass, and uh, you were very squirmy. I remember that. <laughs> what do you think about this live in the now thing? You ever hear that? No, I haven't, but I think it's a good idea. You know, yesterday is history, and tomorrow is mystery. So we all, all we have is today. You know, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So, as the old Latin say, you know, carpe diem sees the day. Most people spend the first half of their life saying, I'm too young for that stuff. And the second half of their life saying, I'm too old for that stuff. People don't fail because they want to fail. People fail because they don't know how to succeed. And as Napoleon said, those who fail to plan can plan to fail. We've got to come up with a plan, people. We've got to come up with a plan because you're not just going to wake up one morning, look in the mirror and say, there you are, best version of myself. Where have you been? I've been waiting for you to show up. We've got to come up with a plan. And how do we do that? We've got to get into the classroom of silence. We need silence. You're not going to discover the best version of yourself out there in that crazy, noisy, busy world where we wake up to clock radios and listen to radio while we shower, watch television while we eat breakfast, listen to radio in the car on the way to work, listen to radio all day over the intercom network, make phone calls, get put on hold, listen to radio. We've got Walkmans and Dismas, we've got DV Demons, we've got cell phones, pages, internet, CDs, TVs, DVDs, iPods. We've got so much noise we can't even hear our own thoughts. And you're not going to find the best version of yourself out there in all that noise. <laughs> Only when you're willing to withdraw from that noise and step into the classroom of silence will you discover the best version of yourself. You may call it love, you may call it compassion, you may call it bodhicitta, whatever you may call it. Literally speaking, that basic goodness, try to recognize that. Recognizing that alone is not going to work. it. After nurturing it, 
then widen its horizon. I don't think happiness is a feeling. I think happiness is a state of mind. It's having an awareness that there is a supreme being, a God, that is in control of everything, and that somehow that higher power has an affection for you and for me and for everybody, and is in the process of creating good out of all things. I believe that, that Jesus wants us to, to experience the relationship with other people. I think he wants us to enjoy the, this creation that he made for us. He created this spaceship. That's what it is, it's a spaceship. And we are stuck on this spaceship. God created it, he designed it, he put us here. He put us here for a reason, I know that. He put us here to experience the spiritual realities of faith, hope, and love and to share that with as many people as we can. And how we do that will depend upon the specific task that he has given to us as the individuals and the reason he made us. How do you know that you've accepted Jesus? How do you know that you're going to heaven? How can you be sure? Well, you can be sure if you've, if you've confessed Jesus as, as your Lord. You're saying that you could have salvation in a moment in an instant. That's all it yes. takes. Yes. No matter what you've done up to this point. Correct. All it takes is one second. Bam. Correct. You're in heaven. <laughs> yeah. When people ask me, am I religious? The answer is, of course not. I'm just a Jew. And I'm a surfer. And I just believe in God. Like everything else, there's a certain preface to where you want to go in life. And surfing develops um, in a person a lot of inner discipline um, and determination to not give up. Because a real surfer has got to be able to take his lumps, wait out those long periods of no waves, and be able to do it with tremendous discipline and not lose interest. Part of a religious uh, quest is to keep that focus. Uh, for a lot of people, it's difficult because they don't have the inner discipline to do it. Not because they don't want to. They don't have the d desire that can keep that fire burning day after day. For people to maintain that high level of interest in anything, it's not just religion. Whether you're an actor, whether you're an artist, it's very, very difficult to do. Surfing is something that keeps you absolutely focused. When I'm not surfing, I'm getting in shape, getting ready for the next swell. It doesn't matter what religion it is, it doesn't matter what you're pursuing in life. The whole issue is to not lose focus. But the basis has to be the attitude and the perseverance, the ability to wake up every morning and just plug away as though nothing in the world was mattering except your own pursuit after that religious experience. When you're surfing, after a while, you're going so fast, and there's so much energy and power. It's an outer body experience, in a way. And that's the religious experience in a nutshell. So there's a story in the Western monastic tradition, which is also a story that the Buddhists have, where these two monks are walking along, and then they go to, a, they come to a river, and the river needs to be crossed. 
And then there's a woman that appears at the same place at the same time and says, can you help me across? So one of the monks picks her up and goes through the river uh, and puts her down. And then the monks continue walking. And about a mile later, the monk that didn't pick up the woman says, brother, I was so surprised you touched that woman. And the one who picked her up and put her across the, the river said, but brother, I put her down a mile ago and you're still carrying her with you. So it's, it's natural for us to be attracted to another person, to have the desire for um, family or the desire for intimacy. And in some senses, monks are about intimacy too, but they're about intimacy with God. They see this as the interpenetration of God with the soul. To a potential monk, I mean, what do you tell him are the advantages? Well, obviously the advantage is that you find a life uh, where you find meaning. That's the main advantage, I think, don't you? Well, is the pay good? Of course, there's no pay, but the retirement benefits are out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get out? You mean like leave, leave? Well, I mean, maybe take a year off, like a sabbatical, and not be a monk for a year, and then come back. Well, it depends what you mean by not be a monk, you know? <laughs> I mean, we, like... We've sent people off to study for a year, but they're still a monk. So you mean by, like, just sort of suspend your vows for a year? And yeah, then, I won't follow the rules for a year. You can take a leave of absence from this life if you, if you need to and want to, but then you have to be honest what you really want to do. And... that um, you didn't call God God you called God love beauty um, but I did notice um, in the service tonight that you do use the word God now so when after your transformation did you become friendly with the word God when I say the word God I'm speaking about life I'm speaking about love the love intelligence that governs the universe and that each of us are incarnations of this presence so uh, the word God previous to that meant some kind of man in the sky that judged you, that had chosen people. But once I understood that God was not that, it became very easy for it to creep back into my conversation. that I will feel about myself is not determined by how you look at me. The way that I will really feel about myself and experience myself is determined by how I look at you. And that's exactly the opposite of the way that most of the world thinks. You know, the world is totally at the effect. And what this does is put you at cause. It's like the Buddhists used to teach. There's only one ego appearing as many. It's so selfish. Or in other words, there's only one of us that thinks that it's here. Yeah. You know, and you're it. If you go through life you know, judging and condemning other people, having negative thoughts, all that you're really doing is sending a message right into your own unconscious mind that you're guilty. It's like A Course in Miracles puts it, you know, forgiveness does not pardon sins and make them real. It sees there was no sin. And in that view are all your sins forgiven. We're taking responsibility for the whole thing. We're realizing that the universe of time and space was not made by God, 
but that it was made in this seeming separation from him. And thus it's not his responsibility, it's our responsibility. So now we can forgive people not because they've really done something, but because they haven't really done anything, because we're the ones that made up the whole thing in the first place. The way it started is I was meditating in my living room and I came out of this deep meditation. I looked over at my living room couch and there were two people sitting there. And they identified themselves as ascended masters. And uh, the woman said that in the previous incarnation, she was St. Thomas, you know, one of the original disciples of Jesus. And the other guy said that he was Thaddeus. He was also one of the original disciples of Jesus. And the major teaching that they would eventually get into uh, is a modern spiritual guide called The Course in Miracles. The voice that teaches The Course in Miracles is the voice of Jesus. And according to them, the Jesus that they knew 2,000 years ago is not the official version. You know, this is not your parents' spirituality. You don't look like an Aikido master. I'm not. I'm just an old guy who's been doing Aikido for about 40 years. But let's try something. Punch me in the stomach hard. Oh. So that's a taste of Aikido. Okay, you're good at that. <laughs> well, it's a little taste. I've been doing it for a long time. But I heard you're actually a Sufi. Yeah. So what's the difference between being a Sufi and being a Muslim? Sit down. Let me tell you about it. Islam, as many religions are, is focused on outer practice. How do you pray? How do you act morally and ethically in the world? Whereas Sufism is like the world's great mystical traditions, it's about inner experience. My old Sufi master told me, anyone can learn to pray, anyone can learn the outer ritual of prayer, but Sufism means to develop a heart that can pray. There's an old saying in Islam, uh, a revelation through the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. God says, there are 70,000 veils between you and me, but there are no veils between me and you. Those 70,000 veils are actually veils that we put over our own souls. So the light, the joy, the happiness, if you will, of the soul is not available to us. Not because it's not there, but because we've covered over with our concern with other people's opinions, our running after things of the world that are all ephemeral. Well, how can I uncover my soul? Veil by veil. Try saying Bismillah before you act. Bismillah. 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 B is in, Ismi is name, Allah is God. B Bismillah. Bismillah. Yes. And not the word, of course, is important. The meaning is important. Yeah, it's really powerful, and I was really scared. <laughs> I don't want to be afraid to, to try something different. I don't want to get into uh, repetitive routines of, you know, self-destructive behavior. I, I, I'm just sick of, you know, being uh, pigeonholed by myself or by other people. Um, you know, I want to be free. I don't want to, I, I feel so limited. I feel so small. For me, I have a few basics. Patience, timing, kindness, honesty, inner peace. That's a good guide. Patience, timing, timing kindness, kindness, honesty, inner peace. Right. In my opinion, the real test is the action. You have the knowledge, you have the understanding. Now what are you going to do with it? Where is the value? It's no, there's no value in just knowing. The value is in doing. God dwells in the depth of your being, not as some entity, but as the formless one life itself. Would you like to live in the now more? Yes. Yep, too late. Already then? Yes. Yep. Again, try it again. Living in the now? Yes. Yep. Too late. Uh. Yeah, you've got to be instantaneous in the now, otherwise you're in the next now. I am the now, in essence. I am not what happens. 
I am the space in which everything happens. That's your true identity. What is real? What, what is real is the, is the cosmos itself and your relationship to it. That's what's real. And discerning what that relationship is and how to work in it is the journey. That's the journey where you are in your life. So if the physical world isn't necessarily real, why would it matter if I did good things or if I became a mass murderer? Well, two things. First of all, the physical world is real enough for what it is. It's not caused to itself. There's a big distinction there. But the specific answer to your question, the philosopher Ernest Holmes said, there is no sin but a mistake and no punishment but the logical outcome. So if you make mistakes, meaning that they bring you an outcome that you don't want, then that's the answer to your question. If you got an outcome that you totally wanted, you would find out you didn't want it. The reason being that what we are is an aspect of an infinite possibility. And when you outline specifically how it's going to be, you have circumscribed the infinite. You've told the infinite how it is you will be. Now that creates a conflict because your soul has told the infinite what it seeks is to be at one with the infinite. So the average person is not experiencing reality. They're experiencing their thought about reality. Now in terms of do we create that? Yes, we create our experience of reality. Happiness does not have to be um, something that happens at the end of some kind of goal. Happiness can be along the way. It's a moment by moment choice. It has um, nothing to do with circumstance or situation. It's a, it's a dimension of your being. When an individual is living to release life energy or to release their talents, happiness expands. Joy expands because they're in sync, I believe, with the fundamental harmony of the universe, which is to express itself. The reason why people think there are many, many moments in every hour, in every day, in your lifetime, because what happens changes continuously. The forms around you change continuously. The thoughts that go through your head change. The emotions that you feel change. The people around you change. So people think every time it's a new moment, this moment and another moment and another moment. If you look more deeply, you see it's not another moment, it's always now. But the form that appears in the now changes continuously. But it's always now. And ultimately, now is who you are. The space of now is the space of I. And then things happen in it and they change continuously. The world that the senses perceive is the realm of effect. The realm of consciousness is the realm of cause. So when your consciousness shifts, you have an ability to affect situations in a way that you have absolutely no idea about. So there is no out there. Not really. The Course in Miracles says one day you will realize everything's happening in here. It is an old story I heard once about a uh, extension agent who's going through the countryside and he comes upon this farmer sitting on his front porch rocking in his chair chewing a piece of grass and the extension agent says to the farmer wow great field you've got great you know your whole farm is just beautifully manicured it's gorgeous I mean it's really terrific uh, God's really done a great job with your farm and the old farmer says yeah but you should have seen it when God had it all to himself <laughs> <laughs> you know we're part of our creation you can't be separate from your own creation So Stephen, what exactly is it that you teach here at the University of Philosophical Research? I teach attention mechanics. What's that? Well, in pursuing an understanding of your consciousness, you'll find that you are what you do with your attention. So until you know where your attention is, what you're doing with it, what it's doing, you won't really have a clue about how things are coming together in your life. Does that mean that you pay attention to what you want and just don't pay attention to what you don't want? Yeah, so what do you want? 
I want to be happy. You want to be happy. Would you be happy just thinking about happiness? No, I just want to be happy. Well, do you know what happiness is? No. So we can forget about the whole universe of thoughts. We don't have to look there. If you want real happiness, there's only one place to look. Look in reality. Now, do you know when reality is? Yeah, it's right now. It is now. But this is a slippery problem. Because now is not when you think it is. Come here, let me show you. Let's use this chalk. Okay, catch. You caught it. Mm -hmm. So you weren't thinking while you were doing that. Mm -hmm. You had to be present to catch that. If you had tried to think to catch it, you wouldn't have caught it. And the reason you can't do it is because the thought is always half a second or more out of phase with reality. That's why you can't drive and think. Have you ever tried to, to think when is the right time to turn the car when you're going around a corner? No, you can't do that. You can't do it. You can't do it. And the reason you can't do it is because you're not in the present moment. So only part of your consciousness actually gets to the present, actually is in reality. And your attention is what places your mind. Mm -hmm. uh. Check and meet. Well, one of the things I've learned about happiness is it's not always about getting the thing you want. But it is about learning how to be with what is. So imagine that there's this great field. I mean, we're, look at where we are right now. But even right here, you can just imagine there's this great field, and it's your field. And you get to bring forth your dreams, which is really discovering who you are in the process of working on your dreams. You learn to even out your experience so that you can give of your full presence into the moment that you find yourself in, into the experience that you are in this day. And it, you begin to experience what you're really claiming here and looking for, and that is a sense of freedom. And with that comes a kind of creativity that brings your essence, because you came here to give your gift. Nobody can give your gift. When I had been in my darkest moment, I happened to read The Power of Now. What Eckhart Tolle had to say about happiness had been the impetus to go on this journey. I was in Vancouver to meet him. You were there on a park bench for two years. Yes. And you, you slept on the park bench? Uh, rarely, but I did spend uh, most of the days on park benches in parks, different parks in London. Uh, did you eat three meals a day? No, no. One meal a day if I was lucky. Oh. <laughs> As you sit here, is it possible for you to simply watch what's happening around you without adding any interpretation to it? To just be present with what is? And you get a taste of what it's like to be on a park bench with nothing further needing to be added to this moment. The sounds, sights, people, the sound of the water, the light. Just allow it to be as it is. With that comes peace. You don't get continuously drawn into events and thoughts and emotions and reactions. You're the wider space in which all these things happen. You're the awareness behind it without which none of this would be here. It would just be atoms and molecules in space. You are the awareness that enables this entire world to be. What about the search for meaning? 
Now, you notice that just a moment ago you were in that state of alert presence and it never takes long for another thought to come in and ask a question <laughs> because thought cannot tolerate the state of presence. You don't have to be dominated by your thoughts because thoughts can obscure the aliveness of life at this moment. Why didn't I know this? <laughs> <laughs> it's a deep-seated habit of uh, being totally identified with thinking. It, it's the human condition, which could be described as lost in thought. Because up to now, evolution has been unconscious. It was automatic. But now evolution is consciously chosen by a species, and that's a revolutionary thing. And you are part of that. What about pain? I mean, uh, physical pain or emotional pain of losing someone? Most of the human pain is psychologically created. There's an enormous amount of psychological pain, suffering, I call that. When suffering goes, and there's a possibility for humans now to live without suffering, that is a possibility. There may still be some physical pain. It may be that you get toothaches or bodily pains from time to time. Suffering is another level that lies on top of the pain. Suffering implies a story, a little me that is unhappy, a mentally constructed entity, a little me that has an unhappy story that is its identity. <laughs> and that creates an enormous amount of suffering. Not only do you make yourself suffer, you make people around you suffer. To be at one with life is to be at one with the present moment because that's the only place where life can be found. You cannot leave the space of now that stays with you, whatever you do and wherever you go. Your life has never been not now <laughs> and will never be not now. Are you making the present moment into an enemy some way, internally, through thinking about some, something which is which nothing, nothing to do with now? I need to figure something out. Well, first of all, be here fully, and then whatever is needed in your life comes. It comes out of the power that dwells in the present moment, that most people overlook. There's an enormous power here which is the power of life itself. And most people look for something and ignore this. And the power of life itself is inseparable from who you are in the depth of your being. Many times you will forget. But the moment you realize that you forgot, there's the possibility of saying, ah, yes, I lost the present moment. And there's the possibility of choosing to re-enter the present moment. The first thing that happens when you re-enter the present moment, you become more aware of sense perceptions. You suddenly, there's a greater alertness. And then you become more aware of the aliveness in your body. You feel the life within. Ah, it's like the entire vibrational frequency of your body shifts when you become present. It's a different state of consciousness. Ah, more alert more life and many times you will lose it and then you'll remember oh, that's good enough now then don't believe the mind when it tells you oh you can't do it now you've got too much on your mind you can't be bothered <laughs> with the present moment those are just thoughts there's no need for you to follow those thoughts to just watch them they are thoughts that the mind throws up you don't need to believe in them because they're not true when the mind tells you, you can't be present now because you've got too much on your mind, then, okay, you can say, okay, let's see if that's true. And then you feel, there's an aliveness in my hand, there's an aliveness in my body. There's beauty all around. And you become present again. Alertness, the alertness returns. And when, when there is time to think, then you think. Then you sit down and say, okay, let's think. Uh, what plane am I going to catch tomorrow? What time do I have to go to the airport? What do I have to do now? Pick up the phone, make a phone call? Fine, that's beautiful. You're not losing yourself in future. It's practical matters. 
And once you've done the practical matters, you've thought about, you've planned your next week, then you come back to the now. The inner transformation is not really about finding lots of answers to your questions, <laughs> but finding a new relationship to thought, where not every thought so seduces you anymore. <laughs> and if a beautiful girl runs past and you find yourself following her, you don't have to think, oh, I shouldn't be watching this girl because I'm spiritual now. <laughs> no. If you can let go, just for a moment, not for the rest of your life, just for this moment, <laughs> let go of the need to understand anything so that you're truly present in this moment. It's just right now. Just what is. But don't forget yourself, because you are the consciousness behind it. You are the space, the presence. Life wants to support you, but first you need to be open to life. What I like to do is live in the future and wait for everybody else to catch up, and that is less stressful. <laughs> Self-love and appreciation simply means that you're loving what the universe, what God has created as you. It's not being superior to anyone, nor is it being less than anyone. It's understanding that you are a unique expression of infinite potential. And so if you don't love what God has created as you, you end up inhibiting this life energy that wants to express through you. So the old notion of uh, poor is me, I'm a dirty sinner, actually inhibits the flow of life. A man's greatest psychic need is to have his thoughts respected. And a woman's greatest psychic need is to have her feelings cherished. Isn't that incredible? If you believe something, your actions will display it. You can't open a newspaper in the morning without feeling crushed, without feeling like, this is what the world is supposed to be like. But to the person without faith, what you see is what you get. There aren't going to be any answers. The person of faith isn't going to have clarity about God's mind because he or she is not God. But he or she will know that there is an answer. High intellectual development doesn't equate happiness. It's only when knowledge becomes wisdom that a person can become happy. Wisdom is knowledge ensouled. By that we mean when you know, when you were a boy, your mother may have told you, now, nah, Sean, honesty is the best policy. And you say, oh, sure, mother. But it doesn't mean a thing until you've ensouled that and that you're honest automatically under every situation. So wisdom is the key to happiness because it represents those experiences in life that you have ensouled and they become attributes of your own nature. What we do now is how we are presentable to others. We never ask how I am presentable to my own self. The word, it is the magic wand of the Totec sorcerer or the Totec magician.
that word right there, what we do with it as gardeners, is everything. And this is keeping our intent and keeping our will and being loyal to our dream. Then, if you use the word impeccable, your life will be always happy. When you use the word against yourself, you are creating all that tragedy, all the suffering in your life. You cannot blame anybody but yourself. I'm running out of breath, man. I got, I got to turn on my engineer thing. Uh, I know you thought you were going to die when you came out of the hospital, so are you, uh, are you happy that you're still alive? Let me turn this sucker off. Uh, let me think on that question. Am I happy I'm still alive? Yeah. Well, I think I can be. I can get there. I haven't got the breath of life. Hey, there's nothing to be happy about. Happiness is being. Living and letting live. And loving yourself. You are here because you are the main character in the story of yourself. The story, in some ways, it's worked, and in other ways, it hasn't worked. And so the character in the story has come here and wants to know how to make the story work better. <laughs> Isn't that so? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, whatever answers anybody can give you of how to make the story work better, there are things you can make the story work better, but all that doesn't really help unless you get to the bottom behind the story, the I behind the story. Then, if you are in touch with that throughout your life, the story will unfold with much greater ease because there is a deeper dimension that is there. If the main character in that story, you, has never known the deeper I, the timeless presence that is the consciousness that you are, the attentive, spacious, As you build your dreams and you say yes to learning to live a life that is negotiating between this, this kind of real high and this real low and finding your balance and bringing into an appreciation each and every day, you'll have some ups and downs and highs and lows and wins and losses. And as long as you're holding that my dreams, bringing forth my dreams in the best way that I know how, what I get to discover along the way is really who I am. And what I'm really bringing forth is more than that dream. I'm bringing forth the gift of me. During my quest, I learned a lot more about who I am. Now maybe I'm ready to forget myself. Of course, my quest continues, but now something I read a while ago that Krishnamurti said finally makes sense. The moment you're asking, am I happy, you're not. No! 
the story begins But here I found myself in a life full of sins No matter what I did, I couldn't seem to win Never had a clue that I had to look within I'll take you back to the place that I've been Couldn't survive without thick skin Pushed as a kid, pulled in every direction Trying to make friends and make connections Couldn't cope with the feeling of rejection Sought approval, love and affection No one listened like I didn't have a voice Told what to do, lost my freedom of choice Parents and teachers, the media play its role I'm tearing at my heart and grabbing at my soul The voice will acquire the chain in my head The voice where my enemies when they said I don't know which way to go I'm so lost, so out of control